August is always a busy month for me. I'm sneaking in the last minutes of summer magic, and I'm also getting ready for back to school with the kids. But it is important that I still take the time out to say happy birthday to my Patreon supporters. I want to say a big happy birthday to Christina, Amy, Jennifer, also congratulations on retiring, Donna, Kimberly, Jane, Reagan, Alex, Nicola, Megan, Mason, Rashea, and Caitlin. Oh, and a happy birthday to one of my kids, Xander. And because I have an August baby, I do know to respect your mother a little bit who was very pregnant all summer long if you are in the Northern Hemisphere. But it is time to put that in the past, enjoy the day, enjoy the month, celebrate, have some cake, and just have a very happy birthday. When a young woman was murdered in Michigan, her father kept the pressure on the police and the public demanding to know who killed his only child. Eventually, two witnesses came forward with what they said was the answer, but their story seemed almost unbelievable. I'm Charlie and welcome to Crime Lines. Welcome to Crime Lines. I want to first off thank Haley Gray Research for her help on this episode. If you're a podcaster and you need a researcher, I would highly recommend Haley, except that she's so popular and busy. I don't know that she actually has any room on her dance card, but I will leave her link in the show notes in case you are looking for help. So let's go ahead and get started on this episode with Shannon Siders. Shannon was born at the end of March 1971 in Michigan. Her mother, Mary, was from the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa, who are from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan on the Great Lakes. Though they are called Sault Ste. Marie Chippewa, they are not related to the Sioux because though the words sound the same, they are spelled differently. Sault Ste. Marie is a location. It was settled by the French and it means St. Mary's Rapids. The Sault Ste. Marie Chippewa are Anishinaabe people. Like we've talked about in pretty much every other MMIW episode, the Chippewa experienced disease, reservations, residential schools, and all sorts of attempts to assimilate the indigenous people. Though the indigenous communities that now comprise the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa continue to exist in the area of the Great Lakes, there was no federal recognition or tribal enrollment for many of them. The Sault Ste. Marie Tribe of Chippewa, as the organization we know today, actually didn't start until the 1940s, and it started with a group of people living on an island called Sugar Island. Sugar Island is located in the St. Mary's River between the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and Ontario, and there is a population of around 700 living there today. Back in the 1940s, a group of residents started getting together just to discuss their shared family and cultural history. As they met more and more often, they started looking at documents and they learned about the treaties their Anishinaabe ancestors had signed with the U.S. government. They saw that when their area of Michigan was ceded to the United States, the indigenous people were given a payment and ownership of 250,000 acres of land. But the treaty was very quickly ignored and settlement encroached more and more onto these lands. Another treaty was then signed in 1855 to make sure the remaining people had land allotments to stay on and raise their families. But there were a couple of things that these treaties didn't do. One, they never disbanded the tribe, and two, they never gave over ancestral hunting and fishing rights to the United States. But because of a lack of organization, enforcing those things was difficult. At the time, the federal government did not see Sugar Island as a separate community, but rather linked them with the Bay Mills Indian community that had a small reservation about 30 miles from Sugar Island. But the two communities weren't really linked, and the Sugar Island community had to tackle some infrastructure issues. They weren't getting what they needed from the state or from Bay Mills, but if they were a federally recognized tribe, they could contract directly with the government. In 
So this group discovering these documents in the 1940s set about getting federal recognition of their tribe in the 1950s. They called themselves the original bands of Chippewa Indians and their heirs. This was a small group, and they had no political ties, few resources, and they were attempting this in the 1950s, which was not the best timing when we're thinking about the government's policy towards the sovereignty of tribes. As we discussed in the episode last year about the missing people of the Menominee tribe, in the 1950s, there was a push towards what was called reforming the federal government's relationship with the sovereign native nations. The argument was that federal oversight was hindering economic and personal growth for the tribes and their enrolled members due to forming a dependence on the government. After nearly two decades of policies that favored tribal sovereignty, this was nearly a complete 180. The plan was to end the sovereignty of tribes and assimilate tribal lands and assets into the United States fully. Reservations would then become cities or counties within the state. From 1953 until 1964, around 100 tribes lost their status as federally recognized tribes. This was a flawed plan that had detrimental effects on communities, and it was eventually dropped. But during that time, obviously the government wasn't really interested in recognizing more tribes. What this time did, though, was give the group from Sugar Island more time to get their documents in order. This was pre-home computer and internet, so they had to go to the physical archives to get everything they needed. By the mid-1960s, as the government was stopping their plans to dissolve federal recognition of tribes, Sugar Island had what they needed. Census records, church records, vital records for individuals, the original treaties, and so on. And the group had grown. It was no longer the Sugar Island Chippewa alone, but according to their website, this also included bands from Sault Ste. Marie, Drummond Island, Garden River, Grand Island, and Point Iroquois. This group then presented their findings to the Secretary of the Interior and were granted federal status in 1972 under the name Sault Ste. Marie Tribe of Chippewa Indians. Today, they have 44,000 enrolled members with the tribal headquarters in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. Now, it has been a while since we've done a history lesson, and I'm a little rusty, so I hope all of that made sense and was interesting enough. Now, we get into the case. Shannon Sider's parents, Mary and Robert, ended up divorcing when she was around five years old. After the divorce, Robert was given primary custody, and he raised Shannon in Nuego County, Michigan, which is north of Grand Rapids. As Shannon became a teenager, her father described her as pretty typical. She was funny and personable with an upbeat personality, and she had a lot of friends. These weren't all friends Robert approved of, particularly towards Shannon's later high school years. This crowd was a bit rowdy, they liked to party, and they were rebellious. Shannon got caught shoplifting, and then she ended up dropping out of school in her senior year. Robert always thought Shannon was smarter than she gave herself credit for, but school was just not something she loved. Obviously, no parent is a fan of their child leaving high school early and being around what they see as a rough crowd, but there were a few bright spots. Not all of Shannon's influences were negative ones. She did have some friends who encouraged her to do better, and one of those was her boyfriend, Brian. Though Shannon was only 18, Robert hoped the two would eventually get married and settle down together. That's how much he liked Brian. During the summer of 1989, Brian had gone to Ohio for a temporary job, so he and Shannon were staying connected through phone calls until he was able to move back to Michigan. In the meantime, Shannon was spending her summer mostly taking care of her new puppy and hanging out with her friends. On the evening of July 17, 1989, Shannon went out with her friend Carol and Carol's boyfriend Paul. It was a hot summer day, so they went down to the river to swim and cool off. Afterwards, Carol and Paul dropped Shannon off at her house where she still lived with her dad. 
Later on that night, Shannon called over to Carol's house to see if she could give Shannon a ride to a party, but Carol wasn't going to that party. She had agreed to a babysitting job that night, so she couldn't go. Paul, Carol's boyfriend, was still at Carol's house for another 30 minutes or so, and so Shannon asked him for a ride as well, but he also said he had other plans. But Shannon must have found a ride from someone because a bit before 10 p.m., Shannon talked with her boyfriend Brian on the phone. She told him she was going to go out with some friends later that night. Then around 10.30, Shannon's dad, Robert, said goodbye to Shannon as he headed out the door for his overnight shift at the Pepsi Bottling Company. He was not aware that Shannon had any plans that night, but 18-year-olds don't always tell their dad everything. The next morning, July 18th, Robert got home from work around 8.30 and Shannon was not home. Since he didn't know she was going out, he was a little surprised, particularly since it looked like she had been gone for several hours. The first clue was that Shannon's puppy, who she was still house training, had pottied all over the house. Had Shannon been there, she would have taken the dog out and cleaned up any mess it had made. Robert then looked in her room and saw that her bed was made, so it seemed unlikely she had slept at home. He didn't see her purse, so it definitely looked like she had gone out. Robert did have a bad feeling about this in his gut, but he brushed it off as parental anxiety. You know, like when you scan the park for your kid and you don't see them because they're holed up at the top of the slide? You know that that's probably the case, but you still feel anxious when you realize you can't see them. And I have to say I'm sorry to the parents of toddlers who think that feeling goes away at some point. It doesn't. It actually gets worse when your kids start driving themselves places. But I digress. Robert pushed aside the feeling that something was off and told himself that Shannon probably went out late, fell asleep on someone's couch, and would be home with apologies for the mess her dog had made later. Robert did, however, call a few of Shannon's friends just to see if they knew where she was, but they didn't. However, Shannon was outgoing, and like I said, she had a lot of friends. She had a large circle of not just friends, but acquaintances. So Robert couldn't possibly know everyone to call. So assuming Shannon would be home soon and being that he was exhausted from his overnight shift, Robert went to sleep. When he woke up that evening to get ready for work, Shannon still wasn't home. Some of the reporting says that Robert reported Shannon missing that day on July 18th, and that's what he says happened. But there are other reports that say she wasn't reported missing until a few days later. But we've been here before with how many cases. What I think probably happened based on the experiences we have learned about here on Crime Lines was that Robert informed the police Shannon was missing on the 18th. They likely didn't immediately take it seriously because it's an 18-year-old woman who just didn't tell her dad where she was for the day. This was the late 1980s with a missing adult. So it wouldn't surprise me if he called on the 18th. They said, okay, sir, let us know if you don't hear from her in 24 or 48 hours. Or maybe they said, okay, we'll keep an eye out for her, something like that. But then when they filed the official report a few days later, that's why there are two different days being reported as when Shannon was reported missing as to the police. There's a difference between the time the family contacts the police and the time the police write an official report in some cases. And this is just my guess in this case. I don't know. It is an educated guess, but there is some speculation on my part. But what isn't a guess is that the police did think Shannon was not missing, missing, just staying out. Robert had told the police that Brian was in Ohio and that Shannon had mentioned going out to stay with him, but she didn't have any immediate plans to do so. And if she did do that, she left without so much as bringing a hairbrush with her. Brian told the police that he hadn't seen Shannon or talked to her, and he had the same concerns Robert did. And Shannon's friends also said they hadn't heard from her after the night of the 17th. So it surprised Robert that the police didn't seem that concerned. What he didn't know was that they had gotten a tip that basically said Shannon and her father didn't get along, 
and that she had left home. She was staying away, more or less in hiding, from her father. When Robert spoke to the police, he told them that he and Shannon had a good relationship, and had she needed space, she would have been more likely to just tell him that and leave, rather than leaving with no warning. But due to this tip, the police believed Robert was simply wrong. Even from the police point of view, I think it still should have seemed off since Shannon was not in touch with anyone else either, like her boyfriend Brian, who she wasn't having any issues with. If Shannon was hiding out from her father, where was she hiding out? The police did not tell Robert about this tip that Shannon was hiding from him, so he didn't really know why the police weren't looking for her. But when he realized they weren't, he did it himself. He handed out flyers, he talked to her friends, and he kept reaching out to the police to find out if they heard anything. For the next month and a half, there was no word from Shannon as Robert looked for his only child largely on his own. Then, over Labor Day weekend, which is in early September, some items of Shannon's were found. They were near a fire pit in the Manistee National Forest. These items were her father's gas card and her own ID. A search of the area didn't find any more items of Shannon's, but they did find a pair of men's jeans, a pair of army pants that were unisex, and a beach towel. These items, Robert did not identify as anything Shannon had owned. It wasn't clear if the clothing and the towel were related to Shannon's disappearance in any way, or if they were just lost or discarded by campers. The gas card and Shannon's ID were definitely linked to her, and they were items you would expect Shannon would want or need if she was staying away of her own free will. So it was at this point, nearly seven weeks after Shannon was last seen, that this investigation finally got started. The discovery of these items turned the case from a girl who just didn't call home to a missing persons case with suspected foul play. There were now more in-depth interviews with her friends, particularly those she may have been with the night she went missing. And there was a larger search around the area where her ID was found. When the police search scaled back, Robert still went out there on his own to search for his daughter. Six weeks into this investigation, which would be about 13 weeks total since Shannon went missing, on October 15th, 1989, a hunter in the Manistee National Forest came across a badly decomposed body in a grove of pine trees. These were identified as female, but that was about all they could tell visually due to the state of the remains. But with the location being within the larger area where Shannon's items had been found, and it was just a few miles from her home, it was immediately suspected that this was the body of 18-year-old Shannon Siders. Dental records were then used to identify her. Robert had searched the area where the body was found, coming within about 50 yards. But in retrospect, he said in an interview with Paula Zahn that he was glad he didn't find her. He wanted to remember Shannon in that last moment they had together where he kissed her on the forehead as he left for work. If he had found her, that image would take over. In that same episode of On the Case with Paula Zahn that that interview was in, they also interviewed the original detectives on this case, and I have to say I was impressed with one of them. He had initially passed Shannon's disappearance off as a voluntary disappearance. But in this on-camera interview, he said flat out that he had made a mistake. I watch a lot of true crime shows in my downtime and for the podcast, And I can't remember another time I saw a detective seem this truly remorseful over a decision not to take a missing person's case seriously. Sometimes I'll hear in interviews, there were missteps made, but we're moving forward. But the real way we move forward is to acknowledge a mistake and not make excuses or pretend it was a temporary bump in the road. 
It certainly didn't feel temporary to Robert, who spent weeks looking for his child alone without police support. I hope this detective had the opportunity to share this experience with other investigators so that they're not going to make the same mistake. That really is how we make things better. Now back to the case. This area where Shannon's body was found was referred to locally by a few different names, like Hole in the Woods and The Pothole, but it was essentially a teen hangout spot, the type of place Shannon and her friends would go, which made the police believe she was likely killed by someone she knew and possibly a peer. As for what killed her, Shannon had suffered a severe blow to the back of the head, but that was far from her only wound. This was a brutal attack. There were additional non-fatal blunt force injuries to the back and sides of her head, and she also had broken bones, a shoulder, nose, ribs, and her skull, and though the remains were decomposed, the Emmy was still able to document bruising. Some of the bruises looked like they were a pattern of dots, given the impression they were made by something with four prongs. When I read this, my brain immediately pictured a fork, which gives you an idea of my limited knowledge of pronged tools. But according to the sources, it is believed it may have been a shingle remover. These are relatively cheap tools available at any hardware store. However, you wouldn't expect just anyone to have one lying around since they do serve a rather specific purpose. This isn't like a hammer or screwdriver, which nearly everyone will own. That said, this is just a guess on the weapon. The exact weapon or weapons were unknown. Shannon had signs of defensive wounds, so she was alive and conscious during some of this attack. And then after death, there were cuts made around her genital area with a sharp knife. Based on the dirt, leaves, and sticks in her clothing, and that her shoes had come off, it was believed she was dragged back to the area where she was found in an effort to conceal her body. A sexual assault exam was inconclusive, forensically speaking, but circumstantially, it was believed that she had been raped. Her shirt and bra had been pushed up, and her pants were entirely missing. Her underwear had been pulled down, and like I said, there had been that post-mortem attack to her groin area. This missing persons case was then reclassified as a homicide, and the police wanted to start with the people who saw her last. Many reports on the case indicated that Robert, Shannon's father, was the last person to see her when he left for work. But then the investigators confirmed that Shannon did leave the house that night to hang out with some friends, and those friends told the police that they dropped her off back at home, which would then direct things back to Robert. This led to some speculation that Robert may have been involved in what happened. Not just small town rumor mill stuff, but an actual police follow-up on Robert as a suspect. There were accusations passed around that Robert was abusive, first towards Shannon's mother, Mary, and then towards Shannon. But the abuse claims didn't seem to have a lot of specifics backing them up. Just one story about Robert slapping Shannon when she talked back to her grandmother, which was something that Robert admitted happened, and he said it was the first and only time he had hit her. Most of what those around Robert and Shannon witnessed was Robert being a strict father, things like making Shannon do more chores than most of her friends. Shannon's mother, Mary, told the police that she suspected Robert, and the police were following up on this. Though the location Shannon's body had been found in indicated that it might be someone Shannon knew or someone in her peer group, Robert had referred to where she was found as a party spot, so it's not like he was completely unaware of the area or its reputation. But if Robert was responsible, the police did not think he sexually assaulted Shannon. They thought it was more likely that he would have staged that part to throw suspicion off of himself. Robert's alibi was that he was at work all night and he came home to find Shannon missing. But there were several hours after he was home before he called the police. He said he was sleeping, but how could he possibly prove that? 
However, the investigators were able to confirm that Robert was at work all night, and they could confirm that he called her friends in the morning looking for her, shortly after he would have gotten home from work. If those calls were some sort of cover-up, it would have meant Robert killed Shannon within minutes of walking in from work. And I hate to harp on Shannon's injuries because it's hard to think about what she went through in her final moments, but what happened to her didn't happen in just a couple of minutes. It seemed impossible for Robert to have done this. The police still had him take a polygraph, which he passed. Though the police stopped suspecting Robert, that didn't mean he didn't face general suspicion from those in town, and that suspicion followed him. But with Robert's story more or less confirmed by investigators, they moved on to work on verifying the stories they had heard about what Shannon had done the night she went missing. They were able to piece together a timeline of sorts by interviewing the eight people she hung out with that night. But interviewing them was not entirely easy. For one thing, they didn't come forward on their own. The investigators only figured out who they were through tips that had come in. And then some had to left town after Shannon's body was found, which was a red flag to the police. And even when they were willing to give their statements, it did take a bit to get everyone to open up fully because what they were doing that night was illegal. Not murder-level illegal, but lots of underage drinking and driving under the influence. So let's go over the rough timeline that was mapped out of that night. The group of nine friends, all teens and young adults, met up at the Nuego Easy Mart, and that included Shannon. They hung out together for about 30 to 45 minutes, and around 11.30 p.m., the group broke up and got into three different cars. Shannon got into Paul Jones's car, and Paul was her friend Carol's boyfriend, the one who said he had plans and couldn't give her a ride to a party. Prior to this, Shannon had been in a different car, but reportedly wasn't comfortable with the driver. The three drivers of the cars drove around together in the backwoods playing cat and mouse with their cars. That's when they race ahead for a bit, with the lead car suddenly slowing down, and the other cars either have to slow down as well or swerve around them, trying not to crash. At some point, according to Paul Jones and his 19-year-old brother, Matt, Shannon wanted to be dropped off at home. Someone in one of the other cars saw Paul turn onto 88th Street, heading towards Hess Lake. Paul and Matt said they then took Shannon home. Matt also told the police that Shannon wanted to stop and get pizza at the gas station on the way home, and then they debated staying at Shannon's house to hang out and drink beer since her dad was gone, but Shannon said she was too tired. The brothers watched her walk inside, and one of them put the time at after midnight, and the other put it at more like 12.30, maybe even 1.30 in the morning. They said they saw her puppy jumping on the couch near the window, and then they drove off to their friend Clint's house. When they got there, he wasn't home, so they left and met up with the rest of the group later on. According to Paul and Matt, they were away from the group for probably 20 to 30 minutes after dropping Shannon off. But when everyone was interviewed by the police, this wasn't exactly backed up. Not that it was really contradicted, but there was about two hours in there that seemed very fuzzy. For instance, at least one person told the police that Shannon was with the group until more like 2 a.m., which was an hour or two after Paul and Matt said they dropped her off. Now, was the confusion because no one was looking at the clock and they were all drinking? Or were one, two, or even more of them trying to cover up what really happened by shifting the timeline? When the timeline picked back up with some clarity, only four of the original nine people hanging out were left, and that included the Jones brothers they all decided to drive down to the river. Paul was driving one car and their friend William was driving the other. William was in the front and slammed on his brakes at one point since Paul was tailgating him and Paul didn't stop in time. He ended up doing quite a bit of damage to his car, but they just shrugged it off for the moment and went down to the Muskegon River and drank some more. When they were done, Paul and Matthew gave their friend Darren a ride home. (laughs) 
Darren said he had been around all night and didn't notice anything off or out of the ordinary with anyone, and that includes Paul and Matt. He said that after they dropped Shannon off, both Paul and Matt showed back up in the same clothes they had been wearing before, and they weren't dirty or disheveled like they had just attacked someone in the woods or anything like that. And Darren rode in the back seat on the way home, and he didn't notice anything odd there either. So this leaves us with the question, who was the last person to see Shannon alive? Was it Paul and Matt? Or did she enter her house and that would make her father the last to see her alive? Or did she go home and then leave again? Eventually, the police came to believe that Paul and Matt were the last ones to see Shannon alive, and that made them the prime suspects. And this was largely based on what they had gathered through interviews, which they conducted with around 500 people. It wasn't any one witness that pointed them in that direction, but rather a combination. For instance, one person told the investigators that Paul said there were lights on at Shannon's house when they dropped her off. She told them her dad was home and he was going to be upset that she was out so late. But we know from her dad's work records that he couldn't have been home and Shannon would have no reason to think he would be. This piece seemed, to the police, like a deflection, planting a seed that Shannon was walking into the home of an angry father. And then the police had Paul's girlfriend Elizabeth, who noticed damage to Paul's car which he told other people was from rear-ending his friend. But when she asked him about it, he said he got into a fight at a party and someone hit it with a baseball bat. Elizabeth was skeptical and told Paul that's not what it looked like. Then he changed his story and said he hit a deer and a tree. Elizabeth didn't buy that either and told Paul he was lying. That's when Paul said, maybe I ran Shannon down with it. Other witnesses also came forward claiming that they heard Paul say incriminating things like how he knew Shannon was dead when she had only been missing a few days, and one told the police that Paul said Shannon got what she deserved. And as we've seen in other cases, there were some alleged drunken confessions at parties. In one, both Paul and Matt Jones were heard bragging that the police couldn't pin it on them, even saying the cops had them in custody but were forced to let them go. At another party, Paul allegedly gave a more explicit and detailed confession. He said that they had taken Shannon to a party spot, and she thought there would be other people there. When she saw that it was just her and two men alone in an isolated area late at night, she got out of the car and took off on foot. They then chased her down in their car, where they hit her, knocking her down with the side view mirror. Paul then claimed that they stopped the car and got out. There was a log or branch behind the car, and they used that to hit Shannon. They then both raped her and left her for dead. According to this witness, Matt was there at the time of this confession, and he was agreeing with what Paul said as he told the story, though Matt didn't contribute much himself. However, none of these statements over the years would be enough for an arrest. Shannon's father ended up putting up a billboard that said who killed Shannon Siders with the number to call in tips to the state police. This billboard generated media interest in the case. Robert told the media that it wasn't just that Shannon was his daughter, but it was that she was murdered. And what was stopping that person who killed Shannon from doing it again? Solving Shannon's case in his mind could save another life. But the case grew cold, and it would be 22 years before it would get another hard look. In 2011, a cold case task force was formed in Michigan as a joint effort of state and county law enforcement. Shannon Sider's case was one they were looking into with five detectives assigned to it for a year. The first step was to go through what was already in the case file, which was over 2,000 documents. And then the next step was to interview some people for the first time and re-interview many people who had been talked to 
back in the late 80s and early 90s. This effort did bring out some new witnesses who reported incriminating statements that Paul and Matt Jones had made over the years. Things like, maybe we shouldn't have hit her so hard, and I think we're in the clear. And one new witness threw a question on the timeline the Jones brothers gave. Paul and Matt claimed that they dropped Shannon off after midnight, but before 1.30. However, one of her friends told the police that she had gone to Shannon's house three or four times that night, and Shannon wasn't home any of the times. The first trip was around 1.30, and the last was around 3. So again, this is making Paul and Matt Jones the last people to see Shannon alive. In July 2012, the investigators exhumed Shannon's body in the hopes of finding new evidence, particularly DNA. When she was reburied, her mother had the opportunity to include her tribal customs in this burial ceremony. Unfortunately, nothing that they tested was conclusive. Another thing the cold case investigators were looking into was what their prime suspects, Paul and Matt Jones, had been up to in the intervening years. They did find accusations of sexual assault against Matt that were never reported from back in 1989. And Paul had been convicted on charges related to a home invasion in 2006. When he was arrested, they found that he had what was characterized as a rape kit with him. It had condoms, a stun gun, and duct tape. But what really ended up breaking this case was a new witness named Jenny Corrigan. During the reinvestigation, Jenny called the police and directed them to a man named Dean Robinson. Dean was in prison at the time, having been convicted of attempted murder, first-degree home invasion, solicitation to commit perjury, and witness bribery. I'm sure it's no surprise that Dean was not a fan of the police, or prosecutors, as he was usually on the wrong side of them. So he hesitated to say anything when they first went to interview him. They only convinced him to talk by playing on his sympathies. Dean's own father was aging and sick at the time with cancer, so they leaned into the case from the point of view of Shannon's father, going over 20 years not having justice for his daughter. So, along with Jenny Corrigan, Dean agreed to talk. I want to point out at the top that their stories did not stay entirely consistent with every retelling, so you have to ask, is that because they were remembering something from 20 years ago and memories are faulty, or was it because they weren't telling the truth? The answer depends on who you ask and when you ask them, but let's go over the basic story first and then we can get into credibility. Dean said that on the night of July 17th, 1989, he had plans to meet up with his girlfriend Tanya after work, and they would then go out drinking with some friends. As he was just kind of driving around waiting to meet up with people, he pulled into a gas station and saw Jenny, who was five years younger than him. She got into his car telling him that she was going to hang out with him for the night. According to Dean, he decided to let her tag along. When they left the gas station, Dean bought some whiskey, cocaine, and LSD from some guy. This is also a good reason why Dean's memory may be fuzzy. After he got the drugs, Dean and Jenny drove around looking for Tanya or some friends to party with. They went to a popular party spot, being the area near where Shannon's body would later be found. They didn't find anyone, but they decided to stay there to hang out and watch the sunrise. As they sat there, a car pulled up and a young man they didn't know got out. Dean told Jenny to wait in his car while he approached the man. This young man drunkenly introduced himself as Paul and asked Dean if he saw a girl in the area walking around. Dean said he hadn't seen anything. Dean did notice that there was someone else in Paul's car who Paul referred to as his brother. Dean saw that Paul kept looking at Jenny, and that was annoying to Dean. Paul eventually got back into his car and drove off. 
Dean and Jenny later decided to leave the area. Dean said it was about 30 minutes later, but Jenny said it was a couple of hours. Regardless, as they were driving, they came across the same car again. This time, they saw the woman Paul may have been looking for. They said she was lying on the road by the driver's side of the car. Paul was not in the car. He was beside the woman and looking frantic. Dean said they couldn't tell if the woman didn't have pants on or if she was wearing a dress or a skirt, but either way, her legs were bare and she had blood on her face. Dean first thought that the driver had hit this woman unintentionally, so he hopped out to help. But as he headed towards Paul and the woman on the ground, he tripped over something and fell. He was on his knees, about to get up, when Paul walked over to him and kicked him in the face. The force of this pushed Dean backwards. So now he was on his back, and another man came up to him with something in his hand. Dean thought the guy was going to hit him with it. But Jenny, who saw the whole thing, started leaning on the horn. This startled the two men who dragged the unconscious woman into their car and left. Dean and Jenny, eager to get away themselves, drove off in a different direction. Dean told Jenny not to say anything about what happened. He said it was just an accident and the men were taking the woman to get help. That's not what he believed happened, but Dean wanted this kept quiet for his own sake. After all, he was 19. He was driving around in a car for hours with a 14-year-old girl. He had done drugs that night and he didn't want anyone to know, particularly his girlfriend. Dean said he connected what he saw with the Shannon Siders case early on, yet he stayed quiet. Jenny, though, said she wasn't really aware of the case at the time. She was just 14 and didn't read the newspapers or watch the nightly news. It wasn't until 2011 that she heard about the case from a friend. She realized the area where the body was found was the same area where Dean had this altercation with a man who had introduced himself as Paul. That's when she started connecting things and eventually decided to come forward to the police. Based in part on these new statements, Matthew and Paul Jones were arrested and charged with first-degree murder on June 24, 2014. This trial was held starting in April 2015 with dual juries. We saw this in the John Juca and Antonio Russo case, which I covered in September of 2019. They ran just one trial, but each defendant had their own jury decide their fate. The state's theory of the case was that Shannon got out of the car after rejecting the advances of the brothers. They then went looking for her, which is when they encountered Dean and Jenny the first time. They then eventually found Shannon, hit her with their car, and then sexually assaulted her before killing her, during which time Jenny and Dean came upon them again. This theory, this story that they had, was in line with what other witnesses said the brothers would confess to over the years. But it would still be an uphill battle with no solid physical evidence. If they hit Shannon with their car, where was the evidence of that? And they raped her, yet their biological material wasn't found on her body. Now, some of that could be because of the time between when Shannon went missing and her body was found but they did find something, hair, in her hand, and it wasn't consistent with either brother. The defense for both brothers was more or less the same. They jumped on the lack of physical evidence and then attacked the credibility of Jenny and Dean. They said that Jenny and Dean were in a relationship in 2011 when Dean was locked up. They thought that if they came forward and helped crack a high-profile cold case, he could get out of prison sooner. The jury took the case, and in May of 2015, 45-year-old Matthew Jones was found guilty of first-degree murder. 43-year-old Paul Jones was found guilty of second-degree murder. Matthew was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, and Paul was sentenced to 30 to 75 years. But this case isn't quite over. A family member of the brothers hired private investigator Bill Proctor who interviewed many of the people who spoke with the police and or testified at trial. And when he talked to Dean Robinson in May of 2021, Dean recanted his testimony. 
In an affidavit he signed, Dean said he was lying start to finish. Not only did he not see the brothers that night, he had never met them in his life. The first time he saw them was when he testified against them in court. His testimony was, according to him, fed to him by law enforcement. He said he was promised a deal if he testified. He wrote that he was 10 years into a 21-year sentence when the prosecutor attached five more years to it. They said they would take the additional five years off if he would testify. Now, it is hard for a recantation alone to be enough for post-conviction relief, as we've seen in the John Juca case, not to refer to it again, but there are a lot of parallels here. I definitely recommend going back and listening to that if you want to hear more about the appellate process when we have a witness recanting. Paul and Matt's appellate attorney is arguing that in this case, the recantation is enough because without Dean's witness testimony, what did the state really have? Remove Dean from the equation and they have a bunch of hearsay. This most recent appeal of post-conviction relief was filed in August of 2022 and is still pending. As of this recording, Matthew is still serving a life sentence and Paul will be eligible for parole in 2039 when he will be nearly 67 years old. I'll be sure to bring you an update when their appeal is decided. Thank you for listening. You can find Crime Lines on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and occasionally TikTok. Crimelines is on Patreon, where I offer early and ad-free episodes, as well as bonus content. Visit patreon.com slash crimelines. If you want to buy me a coffee, the official drink of Crimelines, you can give a one-time donation at basementfortproductions.com slash support. And if you need a palate cleanser after listening to heavier true crime shows, check out Rusty Hinges, an allegedly funny history, mystery, and true crime show that I co-created and write for.